Welcome to America's Top Rebbitsons. May this class be for Rufu Shalema, for Devora Barhana, and also for Branya Batsara. I'm so excited to have on today's show, Rebbitson K. Sarah Cohen. Rebbitson K. Sarah is a certified life coach and the founder of Ohel Sarah, a mobile organization based in Brooklyn, New York, with a branch in Lakewood, New Jersey. Ohel Sarah hosts exciting events and lectures and provides coaching classes and private Torah sessions. The Rebbitson's objective is to visit is to really, really instill into the hearts and souls of Jewish women a love for Torah and Hashem and to strengthen their imuna and bitahon. And this is so, so inspiring. And please tell us more about yourself and what you do. Well, first of all, thank you so much for having me on okay. this um, show of yours and, and um, for really selecting me. <laughs> I feel a tremendous um, honor and a schut. It's such a privilege and a, and a pleasure. So thank you so very much. Thank you. So glad to have you here. Really, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I hope that whatever discussion we have today, um, the women will draw tremendous inspiration from it. Amazing. Because that's what that's what we're here to do, to inspire people. Yes. Um, a little bit more about myself. Well, I was born in Eretz Yisrael, um, I grew up in America, in New York specifically. Um, I grew up um, as a as a non-observant young girl. But Baruch Hashem, at the age of 12, um, HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave me two slaps across the face um, and opened up my eyes to the world of Torah. And Baruch Hashem, I embraced, um, I embraced Hashem in a very powerful way. Amazing. Yeah, Baruch Hashem. I, I have to say it's been a, an incredible journey. Challenging, but incredible. A year ago, tomorrow will be my first year anniversary that I made Aliyah to Eretz Yisrael. Well, wow, happy anniversary. It's a wonderful. <laughs> Thank you. So that's very, very exciting. I Yes, it's very, very exciting. Um, and I've been trying to inspire women for many years now, whether it's through lectures or through my, my singing that I do as well. And um, I'm, just, I'm just happy to be able to be part of Hashem's world of Kiruv, you know, uh, a world of his... Um, the, the, the exploration of it, as well as the promotion of it. And the more I promote Hashem, yes. the yes. more I realize how much more I need to get to know him. Wow, isn't that interesting? Wow. Yeah, you know, I once, you know, I'm sure you've heard of uh, Barbara Streisand. Yes. Uh, La Havdil, But I remember many years ago, I saw one of her movies, I think it was Yento or something one of these like uh, Jewish movies. Mm -hmm. And in one of her songs, she said some, she, she actually, the lyrics were very profound. And um, she wrote, um, the more I live, the more I grow. Wow. The more I grow, the more I realize, the less I know. And very that's profound. really what it is. Very profound because the more you get to know Hashem, the more you realize that I, there's more to, to, to discover. There's an endless world out there of infinity, you know, of Hashem is infinity, he's eternal. So the more you learn about him, the more you realize you have to get to know him more and more. There's so much to fill the being with, you know. For sure, and we're going to be discussing some of that today. I mean, I, I know that you're passionate about Emuna and Bitahon. Correct. And from what I understand, Emuna is a state of understanding. It's a faith that there is a creator. And Bitahon is a state of trust where we rely on Hashem, God, to watch over us and protect us at all times. And I just want to see if maybe you could tell us a little bit in more detail, uh, a little bit more about Emuta, Emuna and also about Bitanhon. Okay. Well, Emuna, well, first of all, you know, Chachamim teach us that the, the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet is actually alert. Each, each letter represents a learning lesson within itself. And it, it works in series of two. Two. So you would have Aleph Bet, Gimel Dalet, Hey Vav, Zayn Chet, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. And the Aleph Bet of Yahadut, meaning the first two steps, the, the foundation of, of, of Yahadut is Emuna and Bitachon. That's Aleph Bet. And Aleph Bet together spells a word, and that word is Av, which is father. So the foundation of Yadut is based on having faith, which is emuna, and trust in who? In the Father who created you, put you here on this earth. The difference between the two is 
like Shamaim Va'aretz, believe it or not. And they don't always work hand in hand. They don't always work hand in hand, sadly. A person can have tremendous emuna. He can be a big bal emuna, which means he knows that there's a creator. Uh, you know, you hear people you, that are non-observant. You can meet them on the streets, even hear Israelis who are far from Yadut. They'll talk the talk of emuna. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. The Hashem is always on their lips. They, they, they recognize the existence of a creator. Right. They have faith that there is a creator. That's emuna. That's the foundation. But the bitachon is the application of that faith. How do you apply faith in your life? To believe that there's a God, anybody could believe that. Even a goy believes that there's a God on this earth. But applying bitachon means what do you do now that you believe in a God? Do you toss his Torah aside? Obviously not. <laughs> do, do you tremble every time there's a nisayon? Do you fear? So the application of emuna is more difficult than the emuna itself. Right. And the application of the emuna is really the bitachon. The bitachon part. Yes, because, because it relies, it, 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 it requires you to activate yourself in ways you're not used to physically, mentally, emotionally. And, and that's the reason, by the way, the lack of bitachon is the reason for why many people suffer uh, in the area of anxieties, fears, worries. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna teach it to you right now. We've talked about the alphabet. Yes. The word da'aga, which means worry or concern, is spelled a certain way. It's spelled dalet, aleph, gimel hey. Notice the, the, the letters, dalet, aleph, gimel hey. Now, if you think about it, it's transitioning through the first letters of the alphabet. You've got an aleph, gimel, dalet, and hey. What's missing? Aleph, gimel, dalet, hey. Bet. Ooh. <laughs> Bet stands for bitachon. When there's no bitachon, when there's no bet, there's daga. You have worry. So the application of faith breeds no anxiety, no fear, no, no worries in your life. You, you know that there's a av, there's an abba up there in Shamaim who's taking care of you. And even the challenges in the nisyonot are there for your good. It's one of the things, by the way, that Yaakov Avinu, alav shalom, struggles with. You see it in uh, this week's parasha, as a matter of fact, parashat Vayishlach, where he's about now to meet his brother Esav, who he knows is coming towards him with an army of 400 warriors. And all the Chachamim tell us, listen here, when your brother is coming with 400 warriors, you could bet your bottom dollar, you know, he's not coming for a little party, get together. Oh, I love you. I missed you. Right. He's coming, especially if they're warriors, he's coming to wage a battle against you. And the end might not be such a pretty end. So the Pasuk says that Yaakov feared. It says, Vayira Yaakov, he feared. Vayetzer lo, started to tremble. And all the rabbis jump on this because they're like, what's going on over here? Yaakov Avinu, the Bechir Shebavot, the, 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 the main, the, the father of the Shvatim is fearing, he's trembling. What's going on over here? Right. He has fear and he has concern. So Chachamim say it's not so Pashut. It says when you're living in the house of Lavan for all those years, and you're not exposed to other people who can inspire you to have faith and bitachon. Even Yaakov realized that that moment, he says, the, the Chachamim say, you have to read those words of Yaakov the right way. You have to put the, 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 the comma in the right place. <laughs> and they say like this, Vayira Yaakov, Yaakov was afraid, comma, Vayetzer lo. And that bothered him. That he was afraid. The fact that he was afraid bothered him. Because the minute he realized I'm afraid, 
He knew that his level of bitachon, not his emunah, right. that what, even if it's a shemitz, it's a, just a spark of a yerida, of a decline. He realized, oh my gosh, if I'm afraid, right. I have to be concerned about that because obviously living in the house of Lavan for all these years affected that level of bitachon, even on the level of Yaakov Avinu. So you see wow. that even the greats of the greats struggled with this at moments of, in moments of challenges in their life where, but, but, but the point is the minute they realized it, they quickly, they, they readjusted, you know, in order to be able to channel themselves towards, towards Hashem. Amazing. It's so amazing. You know, all, all this is just so fascinating because you know, you can see going back in, in the tour, you think, I mean, and these people are great. You think that they're great. They are great. Abraham, Yaakov, Yosef, Sarah, Rachel, Leah, you know, and they all are great. And they are all our role models, but they all, I mean, they were all, they were human, you know, they weren't angels. They were human. And they also experienced the very same emotions that we experience. So I just think that's very, it's very powerful to realize that. And then I want to ask you, you know, what you brought up was very interesting, but the anxiety and the depression, there's so much of that going on right now. I mean, really there is unfortunately and sadly. And I want to see if maybe you can give just like, you know, regular women like us, just some some examples of how to use the amuna we hopefully already have and turn it into bitahon so that we don't feel so anxious and stressed and depressed. Well, the one thing I want to say, you, you mentioned when you introduced me that I'm a life coach. I also want to say that Bo Hashem, I just might got my degree in um, in cognitive behavioral ther- therapy. <laughs> Thank you. And it's interesting that you brought up anxiety and fears and all that because one of the things that that many of my clients have when they come to me is anxieties. They have anxieties and they have fears. Yes. And they, they, some of them have panic attacks and, and Baruch Hashem, we take care of them. But what I'm noticing, and especially if you read Rabbi Nachman's Likutei Maharana, Rama Shalom, he's very big on that. What he would, I guess what he's trying to say is the, the, the despair leads to anxiety. Yes. Despair leads to anxiety, what he calls yeush. Yeush, and that's why I keep saying, do not despair, do not despair, because it leads to what he calls a marash chora, kind of like almost like a black, kind of, a, for lack of a better word, a black cloud that lingers and hovers over you. That's what we call depression, anxieties, fears, all these different, you know, innuendos. And he says that the main key to combat anxiety, depression, is emunah v'bitachon, is to understand that everything that is happening in your life at this very moment is not meant to shake you out of your equilibrium, but rather to refocus you, right, towards a path where you can become stronger, more elevated, more spiritual, and sometimes that that path requires you to carry a little bit of a heavy burden. Yes. That path sometimes is filled with many challenges. I mean, you mentioned the avot hakadoshim. There was not one of the avot who did not was not plagued with some kind of nisayon. Right. And yet you see that that neither of them, not Abraham, not Yitzchak, not Yaakov, suffered from depression right. or anxiety. You don't see that. Right. Chutz from this pasuk that I told you that he was afraid because 400 warriors and the Asav is coming to, and he wasn't just afraid for himself. We have to remember that. He had a family. Right. And that extended family of his, the Shvatim, they were supposed to be now the, 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 the progeny, right? of Am Yisrael, to build an Am Yisrael. And he was afraid what's going to be, what's going to happen if my entire family is eradicated? Where's Am Yisrael gonna stand in this picture over here? Right. It's one of the reasons he divides his camp in two, thinking that camp number one is going to do battle against uh, Asav, while that the other camp will be busy running away 
so that they can have a chance to survive. But the point in all of this is that the yeush comes from a lack of emunah v'bitachon, more bitachon than emunah. Right, exactly. So, so, and even though it's a very hard um, thing to apply in your life, when you're in the moment, yes, when you're in that moment, it's very, very hard. So I always say like this, and it's not me. Actually, David HaMelech says this, and all the Chachamim say this, Torat Hashem Temima Meshivat Nafesh. The Torah of Hashem is Temima. It has a purity. Meshivat Nafesh. It, it, it revives the soul from what? From depression, from anxiety, from fears. So even though we've got the key, which is emunah bitachon, but in order to arrive at emunah bitachon, you need to be learning Torah on a consistent basis. Because as you learn, as you're learning about the avot and the mahot and the stories and their challenges. And then, like you said, I realized, oh, they're humans too. And they had to do uh, um, conquer their own inclination and they had to deal with certain things. And if they're human and they were able to elevate themselves, I can too. And even the Rambam, Alava Shalom, says that I have the ability to be tzaddik. That's a big, big task, right? Or I can be Rasha Kirovam Benevat. But the point is that we're being given these tremendous opportunities through the Torah to do what? To be believers, to have trust in Hashem, to engage and to learn more and more and more about who we are as Jewish people. So Torah Tashem Temima Meshivat Nafesh is if you want to avoid anxiety and fears and depression, start learning the Torah and concentrate on it. You know, give yourself like maybe a weekly shi'ur, a daily something, five minute, because that's what's going to infuse your neshama with the munan bitachon that you need to, to battle and to counteract the, um, the, the challenging moments. Right, that's, what, that's exactly what I was going to say. You know, sometimes... It could be intimidating to somebody to hear, oh my gosh, now you have to learn Torah. They think they have to, you know, people think they have to sit down with a book and learn. And, uh, you know, not everybody knows how to read Hebrew. Not everybody has somebody to learn with, but it can be done in a fun way. For example, what I personally do is I listen to Shirim all the time. Uh, if you go to TorahAnytime.com, they have a, a whole bunch of Shirim and there are other classes online, not just Torah Anytime. And you, just, you can find on YouTube, on Torah Cafe, even this podcast, they're all different um, speakers and you could just listen and just learn the Torah. So it doesn't have to be exactly from a book it could be through a speech it could be even in some local synagogues have classes every once in a while you can go in um there's sure. speakers, there's speakers who come into people's homes like sometimes somebody will sure. open their home to, to a speaker so there are all different types of ways to get torn into your life it just you know you don't have to feel like you have to sit in a basement rush and, and learn like and learn gamara because i feel like that's very intimidating to some people and it really it's not even about that it could be done in a really fun nice easygoing way correct correct Correct. And, and even, you know, Baruch Hashem for the um, advancements of society, mm -hmm. excluding the cuckooness of the, of the social media, <laughs> which has become, you know, uh, devoid of spirituality, sadly. Um, but Baruch Hashem for the advancements of technology that we can now open up, uh, not the women, because we don't learn Gemara, but a man can open up a Gemara, not knowing a word of Hebrew, and he has a translation parallel to, to the page in English. Right, on the computer, on the internet, yes. And it could be on the internet. He could even buy the art scroll uh, Gemara. Oh, right. right, yes, yes. You can buy it. So today, Baruch Hashem, uh, the world is packed. Anywhere you go, you can pick up a Sefer, in, of Ju on Judaism that has some kind of English translation, French translation, Spanish, Russian, you name it, there's a translation. Even the Japanese are learning Gemara. <laughs> wow. Bemet. And they're learning Gemara because they realize that the Gemara sharpens the mind. Yes. So they teach their kids now to learn Gemara in order to sharpen the mind. Go figure. Wow. Very, very interesting. Um, I mean, another topic that I want to touch on, um, 
you know, in addition to Amun and Bitahon is Hashgaha Pratis. I, yes. this is one of my favorite topics. I love Hashgaha Pratis. I can see Hashgaha Pratis is basically the Hebrew term for divine providence. And it's seeing clearly the guiding hand of Hashem in everything. And personally, uh -huh. you know, I, I can see quite often that Hashem is involved in every aspect of my life. But also I do have to say that there are times when his hand is more hidden. You know, when I'm going through something and I don't, you know, I'm like, why is this happening? You know, I don't see the uh, hand of Hashem, you know, very clearly. And I want to see if you can please tell us a little bit more about the concept of Hashgaha Pratis. Well, there are, there are two elements of Hashgaha in general. Mm -hmm. And that's Hashgaha Klalit. Hashgaha Klalit, according to the rabbis, is a general overall divine providence. Mm -hmm which is universal, where God is, is, is um, masterminding and watching and maneuvering the world, the whole world, hashgacha klalit. And then there's what we call hashgacha pratit. Prati is a little bit more individualized. Yes. It's more specific and directed towards, he's aiming and his goal is you. <laughs> you, the human being, or a specific uh, creation. It could be an ant. It could be zeroing in on the ant and giving him this crumb of bread that he needs, right? Mm -hmm. It could be the leaf that falls off the tree that has to land in a specific spot. So there's a, a universal overall intervention in providence, global, and then there's individual, personal, and private. That's why, by the way, Nashem teaches us that already from the first Dibra, the first commandment of the Ten Commandments, when Nashem introduces himself to the Jewish people, what does he say? He says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, I am Hashem your God, Asher Hotzeticha Me'eretz Mitzrayim, I am the God who took you out of the land of Egypt, Mi Bet Avadim from the house of bondage. Now, never mind the fact that the Chachamim asked the big question of, uh, you're the God that's finally introducing yourself to the Jewish people on Har Sinai. You can't come with a bigger opening line, like I am the God that created heavens and earth and the seas and the, and the mountains. No, we don't, Hashem says, uh, Hashem is smarter than that because he knows that if he would open up with that Dibra, everyone would say, I wasn't there when you created the world. You say that you created the heavens and the earth, and the, but I wasn't there, I wasn't there. I didn't know, I didn't see. So Hashem is smart. He says, I am your God. Which God? The one that you saw with your own eyes and experienced your, own, your whole, the whole being experienced what? That I took you. Now here's the key words. Out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Anything sound strange about that? House of bondage? Yes, because it's redundant. It's redundant. If he took me out of Mitzrayim, that was the house of bondage. Right. Why do I need to know that he took me out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage? So either say, I took you out of the land of Egypt, or say, I took you out of the house of bondage. Why both? And Chachamim say, because God is now introducing himself and he's telling the people. Eretz Mitzrayim is klali, generally. Generally, I took you out of the big land, but I also took you out pratit, out of the house of bondage. Are you personally? Are you personally? Meaning, I the way I work is that I supervise the entire world. And you might think, oh, you're supervising the entire world. So who am I to you? I'm a nobody, I'm a nothing. And Hashem says, no, I am the same, the same God who took you out of the huge universal Eretz Mitzrayim, the big land that I oversee. I also took you out of that little house of bondage, a little uh, Dalet Amot space, because you, I zeroed in on you. I allowed the Malach HaMavit to pass by your home specifically, and I knew to distinguish between you and the Egyptian next door whom I struck at the same time. 
meaning the same night. So that's already Ashgacha Pratit. So Hashem already from the beginning, when he introduced himself to us, was saying, my Ashgacha works in two fashions. I supervise the entire world, clearly, and I have this very, very private and personal supervision that's on you specifically. Wow. That's very profound. It's like, yeah, it takes a moment to sink in. You know, it's very funny that you mentioned that today, because just this morning, today, I was having a conversation with somebody, and I... I was talking about Hashgah practice and he said to me, you know what? No, I mean, Hashem is really worried about what's, hap what's happening in the world and, and politics and wars and, you know, different countries and everything like that. Yeah, you know, of course, he is a creator. He does care about me, but I don't know if he cares about every single little thing. I don't, I don't know if he cares about whether my, my little toe is wiggling up and down. I told him, no, he does. He really, really does. You know, because I feel like Hashem is concerned over every little thing in our lives just like you were saying with the leaps falling and the ant and the crumb i mean it, he's involved in every little aspect of our life and it's just so profound like it takes a moment to sink in you really have to think about it correct and i'll give you another example that's more down to earth mm -hmm. of, of something that 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 i saw that i experienced i have this very very special rebbitzin in my life you know, she have a long life and a healthy life. Amazing. And there are times that we're sitting with her in the room organizing huge events, a huge event for a few thousand people in an auditorium somewhere. And, and it involves big, a big project. It's a huge undertaking. Yes. And while we're sitting there talking about the big event and how we're going to organize it and what we're going to do and how we're going to promote it, et cetera, et cetera, out of nowhere, all of a sudden, she'll point to one of us and say, what's with Sarah so-and-so? She didn't show up to the shield last week. Call to make sure she's okay. Wow. That's Hashgacha Klalit with Hashgacha Pratit meaning we do it as human beings ourselves. You can be involved in very big undertakings in your life, but you could also zero in on someone specific and care about him too. Yes, right? sure, yes. Mm -hmm. okay? So it, that's how Hashem works. That's how Hashem works. You know, he's, and that's what, and, and you know, we, the goyim, the mashal, the goyim, what, is, what do they say about him? Hashem, Bashamai, he's like in the heavens. He's only, you know, he retreated from here. His domain is the, the heavenly spheres. Mm -hmm. We say, no, no, no. He's up there. And where else is he? Hashem is here. Hashem is there. Hashem is truly everywhere, everywhere right? Everywhere supervising everything and everyone. Mm -hmm. From the world, from the whole entire world to the tiniest ant, to even a molecule, to an atom. So it's that's, that's the whole inyan. That's the whole inyan. That's the whole subject of, of Ashgacha in a nutshell. Very nice. And um, I wanted to see if maybe you had any Ashgacha practice stories, maybe something that happened to you or something that happened to a friend of yours or somebody that you know. I love Ashgacha practice stories. I do have a Ashgacha Pratit story. <laughs> I've got a lot of Ashgacha Pratit stories. I'll tell you one Ashgacha Pratit story. Okay. <laughs> um, when I came to Eretz Yisrael about a year ago, okay, before that, many years ago, I had tried to come to live in Eretz Yisrael. And while I was here, I, I went to try and get a license, an Israeli license. Now, getting an Israeli license, it is a huge process. I can imagine. It's not like in America where you just go take the test and you're done. It's, it's a huge process. You got to also take driving lessons, cost you a fortune. The whole test costs you a fortune. You got to pray that you pass the test. I had to pass it twice. It wasn't easy. I paid a fortune of money. Finally, I get my license. Okay. When I came here, now this time, I couldn't find my license anywhere. Can find it. And I'm like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And when I came, it, we were in the middle of a lockdown over here. Okay. And I didn't know what to do. Now, if you lose your license, 
it's not a problem to go to the DMV, so to speak, even though the DMV was closed, you can call them up and they, you, then they send you forms online and, and, and you, know, you still have to go through a process and pay a lot of money. But at least if your license is not expired and you, didn't, and you lost it, they can replace it. But the problem was that I was sure my license was expired too. Oh, that had been right. It had been a few years that I didn't renew it. Right. So I didn't know what to do. And I'm like, what am I going to do? I don't have my license here. And how, can, how long can I be driving with my American license? So they were trying to help me, my Rabbanit, and some people in the Keila over there to try to figure out what to do. One Motei Shabbat, it was around January time last year, was sitting Motei Shabbat. And the Rabbanit's brother, who was trying to help me with all of this, remembered. And he says, by the way, Whatever happened with your license? And I was about to answer him. And the Rebbitson's daughter, 22 year old girl, pops up and she says, Your license? I have your license. I have it in my drawer. What? I look at her. <laughs> so I look at her and I say, What? Like, <laughs> What in heaven's name is my license doing in your drawer, in your bedroom drawer? And she's like, one of, you, uh, one of, our, uh, one of my friends, your friend actually, Lee Raz, her name is, gave it to me before she moved to Australia. I said, well, what in heaven's name is it doing by Lee I couldn't understand what was going on over here. What was going on? So I said, you know what? First things first, you have my license? Let's go get the license because now I need to see. Now I need to see if it expired or not. Right. If it expired, it might still not be a problem depending on the year that it expired. Because if it expires within a year, I could still renew it, no big deal. But if it's past the year, I'm done. Oh, yeah. I do it all over again. So now we drive to the house and she comes down with her license and my license. And as she's opening the door, She's like, I don't know. I, I just, I, Hashem loves you. I just realized as I was going up the steps, Hashem loves you. This is such a shgacha. This is such a shgacha. So I said, well, let's take a look at the license. So I look at her license because I try to read it and I'm looking at mine and I'm looking at mine again, again. And I'm like, I don't believe this. I don't believe this. How did this happen? I don't believe this. And she's like, what's going on? I said, please look, tell me if you think, if I'm reading this wrong, does this say that my license expires in 2026? <laughs> so she's looking and she's like, yes, it does. Oh and then, God. hold on. And then it started to click. The started to click. Okay. What happened? Look how Hashem like, connected the dots right here. Right. Three years before this whole story, my friendly Raz came to America for a vacation from Israel. While she was there in my house, I said to her, Raz, do me a favor. I don't know how to navigate myself through the DMV sites of Israel. It's so complicated. Do me a favor. My license is almost expiring. Can you please sit with me and help me renew my license? She says, sure. She sits with me on the computer. And while we're doing it, she goes, well, how long do you want to renew it for? Because you have an option. One year, three years, 10 years, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know what? I don't have to now go through this every single year. Just renew it for like the next eight, 10 years or whatever. Just renew it. So she renews it for the next eight, 10 years, whatever it was, right? Mm -hmm. I guess we did it in 2016, for 10 years. For 10 years, right, right. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And, and then we forwarded the license to who? To her house. Because where's it going to go to? So when she got it, and when she realized she's moving to Australia, she forgot to tell me that the license came. And she gave it over to the Reviton's daughter that if I come to Israel next time, she should give it to me. But that happened two years ago that, 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 that she got the license. Oh my and the Brevetson's daughter never told me. She just shoved it in her drawer. And that's the end of that. In the meantime, I'm going crazy thinking I lost my license. And Hashem says, wait. I took care of you. That license is sitting in the Rebbitson's daughter's drawer. And when are you going to find out about it? That Motzei Shabbat. 
when you're sitting there and she also happens to be there, she also, ha- that's also Ashgaha that she was there. Right. And it's right. Ashgaha that her uncle asked me, what's with your license in oh. front of her? Wow. And she remembered my licenses in her drawer. And it's Ashgaha that I renewed it for 10 years. Right. I don't right. have to worry about my license for another four years, Mahu Hashem. You know what I'm telling you? Telling you? It's amazing. <laughs> this is a, 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 even though it's, you know, you would think it's a very materialistic story filled with a lot of spirituality. It's about my license. It's about my license. But it's not. It's, it's about the license that Hashem gives you to know that he's there with you at every step and turn. That's every an amazing step. story. Exactly. It, because exactly what you said. I mean, yes. Yeah, I mean, it's a license. Exactly. I mean, yes, it would have taken you, you know, you would have to gone through the trouble of renewing it and this and that. But you didn't have to because he right. was so concerned about you and your license. Like he was paying attention. That's my point. He's paying attention and that he's involved in every aspect of your life, even something as teeny tiny as a driver's license. Correct. Amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing that. I love that. Okay. Good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you so much, Rabbi K. Sarah, for taking the time to join us on America's Top Rebbitons. We really, really appreciate having you here. And we hope that today's learning will be for Arafua Shalema, for Devora Bat Hana, and for Branya Bat Sarah. If anyone in the audience has any questions or comments about the podcast, or if anyone would like to sponsor a future podcast, please email us at atrebbitsons at gmail.com. That's A T R E B B. E T Z I N S dot com at gmail dot com. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have an amazing uh, month and a Chag Sameach. And there's that Hashem with the Geula Bekarov. Amen. Thank you so much. And you too. Take care. Yeah, you too. Thank you.